It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah! Woo! This week's starring special guest star, John... God, I'm drawing a... Asher! John Asher! I just wrote down Bonnie McKee. I was going to call you John McKee. Not good. John Asher! Yeah! It's okay. It's been five years at Taxi. <laughs> Yeah, I've known he the knows guy's my name. name. I'm not offended. <laughs> he hasn't been on the show for two years. Yeah. Um, and as I was telling him right before we started, my wife was like up and down and up and down all night last night, going to the bathroom, restless legs, backache. And uh, I had like three and a half hours of sleep and half hour increments. So I'm like... Bleh, 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 bleh. So um, anyway, I'm excited to have John here. As you guys yeah. know from the link that I provided you, that uh, he co-wrote American Girl, um, which was Bonnie McKee's big single. It's been almost two years now? Yeah, it, uh, May. Yeah, it's been two years now. Wow. So I know, it blew by. And uh, he's worked with Dada Life, doing some really cool EDM stuff, has a song coming out with the Chainsmokers. Yeah. Um, anyway, he is everything that I am not. I am old <laughs> and unhip. John is young and hip, so whatever I need advice on something cool, young, and hip, he's my go-to guy. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> and he's been a screener here for five years already? It's Yeah, it's coming on five years. I've been to four road rallies, and yeah, I've spoke at the ASCAP Expo for Taxi like three times. Yep. He's so. very, very popular with the members. They all adore him. I have him. so much fun with the members. It's great to see a lot of people time and time again. My wife pregnant? No, Amanda, definitely not pregnant. We're done having kids. <laughs> Thank you for asking, but no. Um, so anyway, uh, producer Matt is out today. Otherwise, we were going to do just song screening throughout the whole thing. But uh, we got a new phone system on Friday. This morning, hell, all hell was breaking loose with the phones. And so I made the call for you and I just to do Q&A stuff with them, although we're going to listen to one song at the top of the show, which we normally do. And I've got to give you guys a little grief. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm working on an article for the upcoming Taxi Newsletter about people kind of hurting themselves by not paying attention. And in my email that went out today, it had the word song in there so many times about if you want your song heard, song, song, song. Want your song played on today's Taxi TV? Uh, we're now picking one Taxi member's song to review. I left the word two out every episode. Uh, all you need, post a link, a stream, and download your song. You need to be a current Taxi member to submit a song. And by submitting your song, you grant us the right to play your song live on the show. Uh, give live feedback on your song. Have your song feedback included in the archive version of the show. So um, I had Nick filling in for Matt, and uh, Nick said everything we got was like an instrumental cue. We got one, oh, wow. one song. So one person paid attention. Wow. So that person's going to get rewarded, and we're going to hear a singer-songwriter song, which I know is not really your forte. John is yeah. like more beat-driven, poppy, radio. Top 40 stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I do like to listen to singer-songwriters a lot of times because the format I'm kind of finding now is a lot of times they'll take a, uh, a singer-songwriter song and then have somebody produce a track to like right. the chorus of it and strip the verses or something, you know? It, it blows my mind when I hear some of the stuff that guys do on remixing um, singer-songwriter stuff. It like takes on a whole other life. And I've got to say, I used to think it wasn't cool to like bastardize somebody's... Right initial vision but the more more of these that i hear the more i'm impressed by what you young kids today totally. are doing. yeah totally so, um let's have a listen to a song called goodbye to you um and then we will make comments Feet all stuck in mud, and 
flying over. I thought we were having an earthquake for a second. <laughs> the one. Yes, the one. Um, so anyway, that was obviously called Goodbye to You. Uh, what would you think? Yeah, I thought uh, I thought the chorus was really engaging. Um, I felt like the pre-chorus melody, I think uh, you start the pre-chorus deeper than the deeper sea, the deepest seas. Um, it felt like it was a good lead into a chorus, but it just drug on for quite some time. I almost was trying to like I, I can't really even recall the melody, but I can recall the, the chorus melody for mm -hmm. sure. So, you know, I would probably cut that uh, pre-chorus down at least by half. I mean, it really felt like you only needed just that line deeper than the deepest seas and then bring that into the chorus. So, you know, um, but I definitely, uh, I like predictable lyrics. You were talking about um, in the first verse, you go your way. And immediately before you said, I'll go mine, I thought of that. It's not, I mean, it is kind of cliche, but it's still something that I can recall and uh, almost feel like I know the song. So that's always good to me. But um, yeah. What did you think about it? Uh, I thought it was, I liked the acoustic guitar sound. I liked his vocal timbre, his attitude, his yes. sincerity. He got, you know, in so many of our listings, we say authenticity is, is uh, something people in the industry are looking for. Totally. Uh, he, he sounded like he really felt what he was singing. Yeah, That's there was emotion there, yeah. attachment to that. For um, sure. Absolutely. And uh, I agree with you that structurally, um, it needed to get to the point quicker. Um, get to the chorus quicker um, so it didn't lose you. Um, I don't remember. At some point I went, did I hear a bridge? Did I not hear a bridge? Yeah. Um, so I don't even know if the song had a bridge. And, and I'm sorry, I, I got lost in some other aspect and wasn't paying attention, so I don't know if it did or it didn't. But um, it, it has the makings of a better song, but it's like on the you know 20 yard line right i feel like it's to on take it into the end zone exactly it's uh to me it's on the uh it's on like the butcher's block right now i gotta trim some of the fat down on it right now because the pre-chorus kind of it, you know it's just lengthy and it does lose you because i was waiting to go okay is there a chorus in this and then i remembered the concept title goodbye to you hadn't been used yet so i assumed that it was coming but mm -hmm. 
So, um, and pretty darn good for film and TV. I mean, certainly a lot of applications for, you know, break up songs. Um, there were a few little details in the lyrics I can't remember exactly right now, but things that I thought, okay, that may be a little too specific, like walking down the road or something to that effect that, right. you know, it could be a beach scene or it could be taking place in an apartment or a home totally. restaurant, you know, so some specifics like that tend to get in the way, but Absolutely. overall pretty darn good. So, um, thank you very much for sending that in. Hope that was of some help. Um, yeah, definitely. And so, I want to hit some stuff. Uh, I'm, I hope you guys have a lot of questions. I'm going to hit the stuff that I sent out in um, the email, and then we're going to move on to your questions. First thing I want to go to is contemporary pop song construction. Mm -hmm. um, certainly... Uh, we return a lot of stuff here where it doesn't sound contemporary enough. And you are a very contemporary guy. Right. Um, from all the taxi member stuff that you've heard over the years, is there are there any common sins that you can think of that people should stop um, committing in order to sound more contemporary? What can they do to sound more contemporary? Well, let's start off by talking about contemporary structure. You know, there you'll see so many structures now appear in like uh, they're changing it for dance music. All of a sudden, the chorus is the pre-chorus, and then now the chorus is like this big melodic drop or something in EDM. But typically, with with contemporary structure, you've got for radio rather, you've got a short intro, if any intro, and just a quick verse leading uh, into a pre-chorus, which feels as if it's a buildup of sort, almost like momentum to the chorus. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I won't, you'll even hear in pop music, you won't even hear a pre-chorus, it'll just be a verse and then just boom, the chorus, because they're just trying to speed up songs on the radio, you know, that's kind of the format. But uh, I do like to hear some type of a buildup, and with our taxi members, I find a lot of people either drag out the buildup really long, like, like we just heard, or their build up, it doesn't feel like it goes into any sort of like a moment of anthemic proportion. It just kind of like lingers and then it just goes away. So, is it because they're getting too personal and too detailed in the story and it's they're trying to get down, get the story out there and not worrying about that aspect of you know, totally. get to the chorus? Well, we have to make keep it, in mind get there faster and make it bigger. A lot of times these people uh, that are submitting don't realize, you know, that these projects are looking for specific things like the build up and then the drop. And like, for example, in a lot of our EDM requests and listings, we ask for that anthemic drop. And so a lot in, in the EDM music that I'm hearing a lot of times, their drop is really anticlimactic. It feels as if it, it doesn't uh, really go anywhere. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of times people get lost in what they're doing and not thinking, I'm writing this for a specific use somewhere. They're just kind of writing. And I've been there and I'm still always there where I go, okay, you know, I should probably make this chorus bigger because it just kind of goes, bop, you know, and needs to go, bop. So <laughs> <laughs> Technical term. Yeah, yeah. I speak a lot like that. <laughs> um, production technique wise, uh, when you talk about a drop, um, Many drops sound the same to me. Totally. Uh, I mean, Especially in dubstep. and Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, the industry is always saying, give us fresh, give us new, give us something exciting, something that hasn't been done before. And, and yet everything, not everything, but a lot of what you hear has so many similar aspects that it becomes a, a cliche of everything you've heard before. How can these guys move on to doing something, you know, deliver that drop, but make the drop more exciting, fresher and newer, but yet not make it so fresh and new and out there that radio wouldn't play it. That's the, the hard part, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Um, I always say when I'm telling people to reference the artists that are in the listing, um, I'm, I'm really telling you to look at how they're structuring their track. I know it can be confusing. Some people are like, well, you just want me to copy that? No, look at how they're structuring the track, but use... I like to use the word innovation, where you're you're going, okay, this is new. I'm trying something that's kind of pushing the limit, and it may not be something you're hearing on radio, but it kind of has like elements from that, like arpeggiation or like um, I didn't even say that word right. Um, but, it's all right. I stumbled <laughs> on your last name, so yeah, the hell. <laughs> but uh, you know, just innovation is really honestly key to what we do in songwriting and production. Um, there's always, I think, the people who break out, like uh, Martin Garrix with Animals. You know, his. 
like that type of stuff was really it it's derives from something else but he's bringing it into a contemporary structure and format so you know you can always go back and listen to some some hip 90s you know dance songs or drum and bass songs and try to incorporate some feels and elements and vibes into what you're doing now but um definitely just innovate and, and try something new for sure but structure you know the, the radio structure there's typically it's kind of locked in. So, um, what's the BPM range that you find is most applicable to radio these days? Uh, it really depends on the time of day of radio. Like I'm finding that during the middle of the day, you're listening to um, they're the they're throwing back '90s like vibes, you know, during the midday mix and stuff like that. You've got like you know, kind of like some gangster '90s pop rap stuff, like you know, uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony. And so you might be a little bit slower, or mid like mid to up, but then like towards the end of the day and evening time, when they know people are listening to Kiss FM, for example, they're about ready to go out. Their girls are getting ready, listening to the radio. They'll speed the tempos up and they'll play some more dance oriented music. So. Uh, it really just depends. Um, obviously, dance music is going to be a faster BPM. I think what the heart rate, of, like your your heart rate BPM, is what like ninety or something to a hundred, or I can't remember what exactly. I'm it not is, a but... doctor, but I know Ralph Murphy always talks about the resting heartbeat. Yeah, and I, I kind of remember like one thirty. Does that sound like one thirty two, one thirty? I will look it up because okay. I'm interested. But um, but I know that like that like Michael Jackson had said one time he uses the resting heartbeat like BPM to kind of almost resonate with your emotion rather right. than if you're listening to boom, 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 boom. It's just pretty much you're you're just, okay, I'm in some type of mood now. I'm grooving. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to dance, aren't I? <laughs> like <laughs> Ralph, Ralph Murphy talked about how uh, during the, the late 70s into the early 80s when cocaine was all the rage, that the, that the BPM went up significantly uh, like during the Studio 54 era <laughs> because totally. everybody was cranked all the time. Yeah, it's interesting, but uh, there's a science to the music. I, I really find. Let's see, I'll have to take a look here. But um, oh, they're talking plugins already. Um, Amanda says resting heartbeat uh, around 70, 70, 75. 75. Okay, so got you. Let me have to double check on that here. Sorry for my lack of science knowledge here, but ABC is about one twenty-eight. Anyway. Um, Another thing that Ralph Murphy has spoken about, I hate to keep uh, referencing Ralph, but I love him dearly and he's always yeah. right, um, that radio really caters to a female audience and that's whose attention you're trying to get. So uh, you brought up girls getting ready to go out because when guys get ready to go out, they probably do a shot of tequila and maybe brush their teeth, right. whereas girls probably go through a lot more stuff. Totally. Uh, and, and you know what? You see this in TV commercials where it's like a girl's night out kind of theme and that's the kind of music they're looking for. So that all ties into the dance theme. Um, what can people do to make it, again, not sound like everything else, but sound like everything else? This is the big conundrum. The, let's face it, the label guys always say, I want something fresh and new. If you put something too fresh and too new under their nose, it's like, it's that'll never fly at radio. So where where would you place that bet? Which things would you push the envelope on where you, you would be considered cool, hip, and forward thinking versus what the hell were they thinking? You know, a really interesting thing that I've been finding with what I'm doing, even as a songwriter and a producer and an artist, I'm looking at, um, I call it, it's almost like uh, editing a photo when you feather the edge. You're blending the edge of what you're doing instead of being so sharply different than what uh, is next to it. You're kind mm -hmm. of feathering the edge. And so a way to do that with music would be, maybe incorporating a familiarity of the audience already, something that they're familiar with. Maybe it's a um, like a specific sound or like, you know, Diplo has a really specific drop sound. You're incorporating those type of elements with a unique vocal that you're trying to introduce your artistry into. So you could be feathering and blending two different things together. And that's kind of something I've been uh, finding success with, with some of the DJs and other people that I'm writing with. Um, they're going, wow, that kind of that kind of sounds like, you know, this. And then they're going, but it's to my track. And that's really interesting. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think that you just have to use a balanced weights and measures system to what you're when you're writing and producing. When you write um, 
if you're writing alone, knowing uh, maybe you want to bring stuff to a writing meeting, mm -hmm. what do you write on a keyboard, a guitar? Are you hearing it in your head? Are Always you hearing, are varies. You, um, do you start with beats? Well, for me, you know, when I'm writing alone and nobody else is, it's 100% me as far as publishing goes. When I'm writing alone, yeah, I'll start with a beat. I like, I'll, I'll even just make a simple drum loop, something that kind of, not just like a, you know, boom, boom, boom. And I'll get like an emotion in the drums. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I've always vibed with it. And then I will, uh, then I'll add some chord progressions or even just some samples or something to kind of. I always paint the picture first, kind of for me. Uh, as when, this is when it's having to do with like more pop or dance oriented music. Um, certainly, there's times where yeah, you'll get out the piano and you're like, I'm having a night, and I'm just gonna sit here and you know just play some chords that I want to feel dramatic to. <laughs> so you know, there's just different elements. But as far as when I'm working with a professional. Uh, in a songwriting environment that's professional, uh, a DJ will approach me with a folder of maybe four chord progressions that are about 45 seconds to maybe even a minute. You got a verse and a chorus and then it leads to the drop, you know, or something like that. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll even just skip over the verse and go right to the buildup of the chorus and, that, and I'll just start focusing on what is the point of this song? What's first of all the message as a songwriter I'm trying to deliver and then at the same time what's the emotion of the track telling me to sing or, or to feel or to write, and, about, lyrically. Or to write about lyrically exactly. And sometimes I'll feel like, wow, this this track demands a really powerful vocal. And if it's a powerful female vocal, maybe I'll find a demo singer or a female co-writer to work on it with, you know. So um, I never feel limited. A lot of people in the industry kind of are like, well, I want to own 100% of this. I've never felt limited to doing that. I love collaborating with people. And if I feel that this track demands an amazing female vocalist that can be a powerhouse vocal on top of this, and I'm going to call one in and we'll write it together, you know. How do you know when you've crossed the line from collaboration to writing by committee to the point where the committee waters it down and it loses? And can you kick anybody out? Let's There's say you, times. Yeah, Absolutely. That you've got two or three people and what you've got so far is great and you want to make it greater. You bring in a fourth and what they contribute doesn't fly. I, I you, never really go, the only reason I usually go over three writers, and there's really no formula to it, I guess. Um, I'm not stingy when it comes to that, but typically I can get a song done with just me and a producer. But if I feel that there's somebody else who can deliver something that I can't, like in a certain area, and I want to utilize their voice or whatever, I'm not going to be like, I'm writing this, you're singing it, and I'll pay you for it. That, that is an option. I like to also give people success, too, and have them have an opportunity. I bring a lot of unknown writers in on sessions sometimes where I'm like, wow, you have a really unique sound. And like this person, you guys would vibe together, but obviously it still needs to work in my benefit too. So we'll do a, a collaborative session together. The only time I ever see it go over four people or like a committee of writers is when there's a DJ duo, for example, mm -hmm. or like they split everything that you do anyways down the middle. So if it's just me writing with that DJ duo, um, automatically I'm already sitting at 33% of that song, you right. know? So, and typically as a professional songwriter, I don't enter a session without knowing that we're really splitting this kind of evenly because I also vocal produce and I also have production notes and I have a lot of different things that I contribute that most songwriters just would come in there, sing a song and leave, you know? Right. So I make sure that it's an even split. Um, but anytime it goes over four people in a thing, it's kind of, well, why is, what are we not capable of that we have to bring a fourth person or a fifth person in on this? And typically I only see those situations if... Um, somebody, a, a label wants somebody to produce something on it or they have an idea for it or we're sampling somebody that has writer, writing ownership of what we're sampling. Uh, let's talk about the politics. Uh, I didn't think to write that question down and yeah. I am going to come to your questions momentarily, but the politics of all this stuff, you mentioned sometimes a label has somebody that they want you to bring in. Right. Uh, back in my day, the label, um, if it was a baby band that just got signed and maybe they had a local manager that got them that far, the label would suggest a bigger manager that had more clout and some pull at radio and other connections. Absolutely. Um, and also they would suggest a big producer. Um, so nowadays they might suggest a, produce, a writer producer they want you to collab with. Are you stuck with that person? Do you have to play this political game of, oh, crap, you know, they, they've suggested that I work with this DJ or this producer, and we're just not gelling? Um, do you have to be fearful that if you go back to the VP of a and at the label and say, it's just not happening, that they're going to go, you know what, screw you uh, in their mind. You well, know, I'll find somebody else this guy can work with. Does it, does it hurt you, to be honest? 
No, I'm uh, probably one of the most honest, direct people that you could probably come across in this industry at my age. Uh, I really have no problem telling anybody how it is. But at the same time, I'm also the one of the more, uh, I like to think of myself as humble and also willing to kind of uh, make things work. Even if I know that they're kind of leading down a road that I'm like, uh, where's this going? I'll still try to accommodate as much as possible. And then if I need to reach out to a representative of the label or something, I'll do so. But um, I mean, with me, I try to, uh, bl I'm a blending type person in the studio where I take everybody's opinion into consideration. And if I strongly feel against like a lyric choice or something, I'll just kind of give them reasons to why, you know, I'll, I'll kind of show them why I don't see that that works, you know. Um, I'm right not then. somebody who writes negative messages. This is one that I come across a lot in uh, what, what we're doing. A lot of my co-writes, um, people will want to, you know, over sexualize lyrics or over uh, be negative in certain ways or certain things. And I like to find the positive side of the lyric because mm -hmm. I don't feel like people want to listen to songs that are going to be negative messages. That's just my observation. I, there's I, still I like that. Yeah, there's still mm -hmm. going to be people out there who are like wanting to be the villain, you know, or whatever. Right. But I like to write positive things, um, you know, so. If there's a way to say a um, like, for example, here's a here's a title that I just use, and everybody in the room is gonna probably go, you know, use this now. But it's okay, <laughs> it's on the record. <laughs> I wrote a song, uh, you know, the saying "Love you to death." Um, that's like to me. I was always like, well, why? Uh, okay, till death. Like I was always like that left kind of a negative connotation to me. So I said, let's write a song called "Love You to Life," and that kind of brings you to a new vision of right. this old saying, Flipped right? Flipped it on its head. Yeah. Flipped it on its head, and you know, there's um, there's been similar songs like that written out there, but um, I didn't find that out until I searched Google for it. But it was to me, I was like, wow, that felt really good hearing it that way. "Love You to Life." It's like I'm bringing somebody back to life who who isn't feeling, you know, so. Well, so you know, there's definitely ways to make positives out of. Uh, a lot of times, people can't see past that negative, you know. So, <laughs> uh, you know, if you need negativity, just turn on the news. Uh, I think most people Absolutely. turn on the radio because they want something to feel good about. Absolutely. Um, it's it's funny that you talked about. Well, I, I googled and found that that lyric was already used uh, the other day. I had an idea for Taxi TV that every week I'm going to give out a, um, a song title and have people write to it and then pick the best one that comes in and play it on the show. And the first one that I came up with was Walk a Mile in My Blues. <laughs> That's good. Well, apparently it was really good because somebody else already had a song called Walk a Mile in My Blues. And, and, and you know, I don't think you can copyright a title. Um, and, and it's hard to come up with an original idea. But How many millions of people are writing songs in this world? You know what I mean? The, the odds yeah. that somebody have has used your concept or title or even in the same kind of twist that you've done are just the astronomical. I mean, it's so easy to, to find somebody who's written a song with your title. Right. I mean, look at a Grammy Award winning song, you know, or even a Grammy Award winning artist like... Um, Sam Smith, he's got a song called Stay, right? Isn't yeah. it Stay? <laughs> so simple. Think about how many people have written that song. Probably you know? a thousand or more. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that, uh, that, I'm sorry. Stay was Rihanna. Who am I thinking? Stay With Me is what I'm thinking of right. Sam Smith. Stay With Me. But that, even that, I wrote a song before I moved to LA called Stay With Me. And I'm, when I saw that, I thought, whatever, you know. Back how in could the 40s and 50s, there, exactly. there were songs of that title. Um, okay, so I'm going to start taking questions from you guys so that I don't hog the whole show by running my stuff uh, by John. Um, yeah, throw some questions at us. Anything you've got, we can answer it. Let's see if anybody did some questions up here. Collaboration in the cloud, huh? Hmm. Does anybody have questions? Uh, there's like a delay. 10 second delay, yeah. They're coming, I guarantee you. Okay. Uh, I want to make a comment. Uh, okay. Uh, what are your five top EDM songs? I can't even give you the five top. There's, I mean, gosh, there's so many. Um, I'm such a, you know, it's funny. I had the opportunity to work with Dada Life, and I wrote a song for them called Boing Clash Boom. We collaborated on that a couple years ago. They actually had sent me a track to their main song, um, Kick Out the Epic. That's what it's called. It's like their big, it's like a big song in the EDM world. I hear it used 
time and time again before the drop of even just mixes DJs are doing. So I would say that D Dada Life holds a, a spot for me as far as EDM is concerned. Um, I definitely love what they're doing and was so lucky to work with them. And um, they're great guys. Um, Sam Elliott asked, uh, how do I make it in America? He's from uh, the UK. Okay. Um, it seems like now you'll have even a better chance than most Americans to yeah. it. <laughs> to be, I was thinking about this leaving taxi, I think, maybe like two weeks ago. How many friends I have that are from foreign countries that are getting record deals out here or getting big songs, you know, on the real. There's some fascination, especially with guys from London, with this like, almost like, oh, they're from London type of a thing. It's like the industry and the audience are so fascinated by the Sam Smiths of the world that have these, you know, edge to them that we're, you know, in America, we're getting so drained out by hearing the same <laughs> Rune 5 vocal over and over again, you know? So it's just, uh, to me, I, I don't think that, I think really the only thing that's limiting you for making it is uh, you, really. I mean, you just got to go out there and make it happen. <laughs> so I, I've always contended, if you've got great songs, everybody loves you. It all comes down to that. It really does. Um, sometimes you can be a great artist with tremendous charisma and great vocal chops and a great look, and you'll find the right producer that will bring in the right songs or the right uh, label person that's got a vision for you and they make it all happen. But more than anything, it's about songs. Um, people always ask, you know, can I get signed to a record deal if I don't have a following, if I don't have a big social media presence, uh, if I'm not selling out clubs, if I'm not touring? And my answer to that is they love that stuff if you've got it. But if you go to a record label and you've got a great voice, and I'm not talking about a classically great voice, I'm talking about a voice that stands out and you go, that's who that is. Mm. The minute you hear it um, and great charisma and the whole package is working and you've got three incredibly strong songs, they really don't care about that other stuff nearly as much. Completely. Uh, okay. Uh, what headphones do screeners use? We use middle of the road Sony headphones. Um, and I even, you know, bring in my own headphones from, from home. I use Sony's and, uh, you know, I mean, I have, I have a bunch of different DBX. I bring in a few. It just depends on what I'm grabbing. Um, hi, John. I've been in TV with some success in EDM. Okay. Uh, how might I start to work with other producer artists? I get that question so often and... You know, it's still something to this day that I that I do. If you're working in the EDM world, I mean, there's so many people doing EDM, especially now. Um, I would send some of your work to uh, publishing companies that are focused more on EDM or even with Taxi. We, we run so many listings. I'm running some listings right now for a specific film TV publishing company that uh, are seeking people to collaborate. And, um, you know, how I did it when I was younger and... Not that I'm not young, but when I first started, <laughs> that, made me, that made me sound like 40 when I was younger. But he could be my kid. He could easily be my kid. Um, but when I when like uh, when I was first reaching out to people, I would send them what I've done, and it gives them a frame of reference. And then if they want to collaborate, that's completely on them. I don't think you can make anybody collaborate with you. Um, but if you want to work with other producers and artists, especially with Taxi, I mean, we have such a great membership base of people who you will not believe. At all of the events where I meet these taxi members, every single one of them are like, I'm trying to find like a vocalist. Or the vocalist is like, I'm trying to find a producer. And they're and I'm standing like, right next to you at the bar at the convention. Absolutely. And I'm sitting here going, why don't I just make like a sign-up list and say, producers, put your email here. And what kind of genre you do. And then singers, you put your thing here. And then I'll just connect the dots. Because like I'm sitting here as the medium point for both people. And I'm going, I just saw a producer walk by here 10 minutes ago we looking up, for you. <laughs> we put up a big bulletin board one year and had people putting uh, post-it notes on there and three by five index cards looking for this looking for yeah. that whoops looking for my pen now and it's and, that but nobody used it people would do stuff like anybody want to go for a drink later yeah it's uh, there needs to be some type of um i don't know like i guess uh the internet hasn't birthed this yet but i think myspace was a really good spot for it at one point where it was almost like a sounding board for people to discover each other i absolutely still to this day work with people that I found on MySpace. And um, I think that we have that with Taxi. We have somewhat of a social network that a lot of people haven't really tapped into. Um, you are so lucky to even be a part of something where there's almost like a hub of people that are looking for each other. So, and I think if you 
if you focus your attention not outward so much, looking, 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 but you kind of look at what you've got in front of you, you might find it. We've so. got collaborators that have met in the chat room on Taxi TV. Yeah. Um, they've met on the forum. Uh, not, I mean, really, like 10% of our members use the forum and probably 1% or 2% use it actively. It's such a great resource. It is. Um, make a t-shirt that says what you do. That's a great idea, actually. I saw that at the ASCAP Expo. A girl had a, a thing pinned onto her back and it said, I'm a singer, inquire within or something like that. And I was like, I literally was like stopped in the middle of my ASCAP critique with this person and I was like, did you see that girl walk? She's like, everyone's seen her. I'm like, well, she's probably getting numbers. Like, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, but come on. Yeah. Uh, go inquire within. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, That's funny, actually. Okay. Uh, can I get signed it? if I'm not good live, but can I but can write great songs? That's a common common story. I mean, um, here's the thing: you need to if you're going to be an artist, you should be focusing on being amazing. There's really one thing as an artist that you should be doing: it's practicing over and over and over again. Um, you know, I think what are your goals as an artist? If you want to be an artist that solely puts stuff on the internet, you could probably be a mediocre talent and, you know, just uh, be a really amazing songwriter and probably still get some hits on the internet. But if you're looking to go on what I call the world stage, which is, you know, you want to play Good Morning America and be an artist, you want to be in front of record labels doing, you know, showcases, they're going to look past you if you're not good. That's just the bottom line. I mean, it's it's almost like walking into a room and, and listening to somebody sing and being like, ah, I'd, I wouldn't turn that on or I wouldn't amazingly turn that on in my car for sure. And yeah. conversely, I get asked this question when I'm like at a Thanksgiving dinner or a wedding in social settings and people go, oh, I hear you're in the music business. You know, my daughter sings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you get that a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, some of these people are amazing singers, but they sound like American Idol contestants. Yeah. There are a million very, very good singers out yeah. there. Yeah. But there's like one in 10,000 where you go, holy crap, you've got something special. Hmm. And it's it's impossible to describe what special is. It's so impossible. It's the X factor. And yeah. not, not talking about the TV show. <laughs> right. They took that from the saying. It's the X factor of where that person has uh, not only just a great voice, they've got a good image, they've got a great... And the image doesn't even matter anymore. I mean, anybody, you got, you know, Sam Smith didn't really have an image until he broke. And then all of a sudden that was an image. Right. And it's like, you know, you, you, you just have to have it. And I think that that comes from really understanding who you are and looking inside and kind of realizing what is your art? Who are you as an artist? And I always refer back to what is your message? Because like for me, my message is evolution. I'm here to bring forth futuristic, positive ideas to the world. A lot of people have different types of messages. Some people are, you know, unrequited love or, you know, whatever it is, their message to the world. So I think that you just have to kind of understand who it is as an artist that you are. Um, this guy, um, I don't know if it's a guy or a girl, actually, uh, Taxi Stream keeps posting th same thing over and over. <laughs> and Jim Carvalho is saying, do you work for Taxi? Definitely not. Uh, hi, Michael and John. This is Taxi Stream's question. Uh, hopefully everything won't fly off the thing too quickly. When we submit songs, whoops, there it goes. Oh, here it comes again. Gee, <laughs> persistent. Uh, when we submit songs, you accept one of those, then forward it to the prospective company. Then the company calls and asks for more of the same, and I submit the other two songs you rejected, and they accept the songs. How can the A&R justify the rejection? Also, I'm aware it's subjective. Uh, my answer to that, and I want to see what John's is in a second, but my answer to that is sometimes they, if, if you submit four songs to something, they don't want to forward all four songs because they'll pick the two that they think are the strongest and, and lead with those. Um, you know, you're in the trenches, you're the screener. What do you do if you come across four songs from the same person? Do you, are there times that you forward to and then don't forward the other two? So if I'm correct, I'm looking at your question again and you're basically saying if we had submitted, if they had submitted three songs to us and we forwarded one song out of those three and then the other two you played for them once you had got the forward, but right. without outside of Taxi and our opinion, you played it for the company we and they liked them. Yeah, we didn't forward it 
the first time or the only time it came through. Right. Okay. So, so here's my question to you. How many times have you listened to a song that your friend didn't like, but you were like, this is awesome. This is awesome. Or vice versa. Somebody's playing you a song and you're like, okay, that's not really resonating with me, but that person's in love with it. I think it's that type of an idea where I, a lot of times there's been times where I I've rejected a song and then two months later, that same song came in for a certain listing and I go, you know what? Second time around listening to this, third, fourth time, I kind of like it, and maybe I'll forward it on this time. And I think that that really just depends on there's to context. Context. Sorry. No, absolutely. <laughs> I was going to say that depends on the listing, which is the context. I mean, did the song work for what my uh, specific listing says? So if they're re re seeking universal lyrics and melodies that are anthemic in a, you know, po like a pop funk vibe, like I'm doing one right now. Um, you know, the lyrics are talking about running on a beach. I'm sitting here going, okay, well, that doesn't really work for a universal context when we need to use it for a variety of scenes. So my objection would be that you had specific lyrics and that my opinion is that they probably will not accept this song since they're looking for broader, you know, storylines. But if you play it for them outside of Taxi and they like it, it may not have been for the project that we're working on. It may have been for something else that they see, right. see, oh, you know, that we don't have access access or even know about. So, you know, it may be something that they had an idea for. It's when you're dealing with somebody directly, they're coming up with ideas as they listen to music. Like, oh, we can put this there and we can put shop this here. And if we or don't... Or it's generally good and someday, you know, it, right. it's kind of no skin off their butt to sign the contract and put it in the catalog. Oh, no skin completely. They'll, they'll so, sign your whole catalog and then they'll be like, we, you know, we got you here. So, and we can put you in a variety of things. So... You know, it's just up to, A, we're, we're a filtration system, like as screeners, we're filtering what goes to this, but B, there's another filtration system on top of us, and if songs make it through that we submit to them, then they're going to, you know, they're going to like them or whatever, but if they hear something else, then, you know, that's up to them. It so. happens a lot that, um, you know, somebody will submit three or four songs, and one or two are on target for what the listing asked for. And even though the other ones are equally as good or maybe 95% as good or 90% as good, the screener thought these are the two that's right to forward for that listing. Then right. when you get the open door and you play it for the, the company, they go, this is pretty good too. But if we'd forwarded it to them in the context of that listing, they'd right. be scratching their head going, that wasn't what I asked you for. And believe me, we get chewed out for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we push the envelope about as far as we can, and we kind of have to judge how far we can push it depending on who we're sending the stuff to. Totally. Um, I'm scanning. What's the NSA? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a music question. Uh, you know, Excuse me. To see the screeners? Yeah, that's funny. John, what genres do you screen at Taxi? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, primarily, I'm. We have so many uh, submissions that are in the pop field, and you know, I I write a lot of pop music, and I have experience with pop producers and songwriters. So, um, I primarily do pop, but I'm not limited to one genre. There's uh, there's other people that I would say, you know, this instrumental cue is probably better critiqued by so and so rather than myself. So I'm probably going to be mostly focusing on um, let's say EDM, dance, dubstep, pop. Um, right now I'm doing a funk listing like a la Mark Ronson. Um, I'm screening a bunch of different stuff. Um, I mean, just complete, right. Actually, I'm also screening uh, contemporary Christian hip hop as well. So, and these are things that I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm young and hip, like you said. And so I have knowledge on this. I <laughs> and mean, he knows he is. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you when it's good and when it's bad. Absolutely. He for can. sure. He's got great ears. Um, um, and I'll be honest too. So he will. And, and he's a champion of, of, you know, that's something that I don't talk about enough and I probably should, which is our screeners are all, the vast majority are like John in that they love music. They love musicians. They are musicians. They got into the industry because they love music and they're champions of great songs and great artistry. So if they're going to fall off the log, people want to believe that people who are filtering in the industry are trying to keep them out. 
Not there's that's so yeah that's a silly one. I mean, with me especially, I can't tell you how many people I've personally. I'm 27 years old, and when I was 20, I started shopping other artists and writers for positions in the industry. Like I've I've got people gigs at publishing companies. I've got people uh, publishing deals. I've signed people to really huge producers. I've got people record deals, and I feel like when you I look at them as seeds. When you plant your seeds in a garden and you water those seeds and you maintain those friendships and you know, you're not just trying to get things from them, you know, there are fruit to those seeds and yeah. after they after they bloom and grow. And you know, it may not be two months, two years, five years down the road, but you could know Could be twenty. Could be twenty yeah. years, but somehow somebody's like, you know what, you helped me when I was a lot younger and I wanna help you now. And so I look at it as a just a more of a mutual relationship and um, to thrive rather than to limit anybody. Man, there are some people that will limit you in this industry and those people will not make it past themselves like they can't they can't even see outside what they're doing it's just all about them their project da, 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 you know and they're not willing to even listen to anybody else you know I've heard people said they don't like other artists and I'm going well if you don't like other artists then how are you even an art because or an artist yourself because to me it's about connecting and finding the other artists who also share that vision with you and they see what you see and, and really like it you know so I think that uh, honestly um, yeah I don't even remember the question anymore I just, well, <laughs> you know one of the things that um, you talk about planting seeds is, is sometimes we will have um, music coordinators that work for uh, music supervisors on really big TV shows that get the okay from their bosses to run listings for what they know they will use on that show mm -hmm. and they screen the stuff at night and on weekends and we're planting those seeds because a fair number of those people are going to become supervisors five years down totally. the road. Totally. Um, I would not be surprised someday if you end up being VP of A and R at a major label. And when John is, John's going to tell everybody on his A and R staff, "Turn to taxi." Absolutely, and I still do to this day. You know, um, it's funny to me that like, it, it, taxi is one of the few things in the industry that I think a lot of people don't really understand. And um, it's That's funny, for sure. And it's it's weird because they could benefit. I've been getting the taxi emails like I said, I'm 27. I've started getting the taxi emails at 14 years old. Did you know that? Did no, you? I didn't know at that. 14. Wow. And, and still to this day, I have an email, uh, AOL email address, and I don't use it at all, but I use it for like all my spam email. And I'll log in and I'll still see the taxi emails in there. And I'm laughing to myself by going, I remember when they were saying, a la Avril Lavigne, like way yeah. back in the day. <laughs> and I legitimately was confused at what that meant. And still, I record, I wasn't even a member, and I would record on my dad's karaoke cassette tape. Uh, uh, recorder and I would record like a la whoever it was Aaron Carter or whatever it was back in the day and I would try to like it would actually actually it would just get me to record something I would never send it off because I wasn't a member but <laughs> but uh, the taxi is such a great hub for people to you know express their talent or if you're not looking to even break in the industry you're just trying to learn about songwriting it's a great place to sharpen your tools um... A. Carrig one uh, asks a question, do screeners get assigned projects uh, hyphen listings or do they look over all those that come in and choose the stuff they're interested in? They get assigned the stuff depending. We evaluate them as to where their talents lie. Um, you know, film, TV, um, record, radio stuff, which genres they're good at. And we've actually got um, kind of an algorithm. It's not really a computer algorithm, but it, it's like we call it the depth chart where we look at these are the things that are deadlining this week and this is who gets assigned to them. Now sometimes John may have a, a friend who's the vice president of A&R at Warner Brothers who says, yeah, John, if you can find me this kind of act, go for it, man. So he has authorization to run a listing and he's the ears on it before it goes to Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the only time another set of ears would be on it is if John can't make the deadline because he's going to be on a session. He got a session you know, for a week, and he'll call us, and we may put another screener on that he knows whose ears that he trusts. But most of the time, um, it's us assigning the screeners to stuff that we know that they excel in. We don't put country screeners on R&B stuff, for instance. Right. Um, why is production quality more important than the song? I don't know that anybody ever says more important than the song. Why is production quality more important than the song? You may be talking about, are you talking about the sonics of the production or like the quality, like the audible quality of the song? Um, I don't think that it's more important. I think that everything married, marries together. Um, 
But there is a, something to be said about dated production. And if your song, like, there's many times I hear a song that's awesome. And I'm like, wow, that's really, really cool. We were just running a listing looking for some, like, 80s type music. And, um, you know, we get a lot of actual 80s music submitted that sounds like it's it. But I'm going, wow, that song on top of it. If there was a new production to that and an artist, like, I'm really into the 80s, an artist like me wanted to record that, I would sit there and be thrilled. But the fact is, is that I couldn't, for the listing in particular, the, the person that's running the listing can't hear past the quality of the production or the datedness of the production. So, you know, because the other stuff they're going to get won't have that issue. Right. So it is somewhat comparative, not necessarily stuff they're going to get from us. Right. But they're going to have, you know, they could be getting stuff from Rock Nation, Rock Mafia, mm -hmm. all these great writing production teams. And then along comes your thing that's not competitive with them. Right. Um, and, you know, it's up to judgment because there's sometimes where I'll hear something and if it's a listing that I'm running and, you know, I'm like, okay, I can still hear through that and maybe I'll take it upon myself to explain the song when I send the song to the person. But at that point, that's really I'm taking it upon myself. That person could just go, no, what is this? You know, but I think that when we're just sending these off to companies that are, you know, publishing houses that are interested in what we've got. Um, we have to have a level where it sounds contemporary and it sounds marketable and there's not much work more that needs to be done to what's happening to get the song to where it needs to be. Because for film and TV, for example, they usually just take what you've got and put it on air. I mean, I've right. had several songs that I made in like my parents' bedroom or my, my bedroom, my parents' house when I was 16, 17. I used to put two pillows like this as my sound, as like the sound barrier to like not get a room noise. I would put two, hold two pillows around the microphone and sing into it. And like, you know, that ended up on real world MTV. And like, it's just like, I'm sitting there going, if only you could put a visual in the corner of me recording that song with like how people would feel about it then, you know? But I think that it's just about the quality that you bring to it. And that comes up to, uh, that that's, you know, your talent. If you can mix it well, then, you know, it sounds great. Somebody posted, um, oh, here it is. Uh, I submitted a song to a listing for a solo uh, artist, I presume, that was recorded as a duet but could be sung as a solo artist, but the reviewer returned it for that reason because it was sung as a duet. Can the reviewers listen outside the box? I'm going to, I can answer that question, but I want you to answer it. So it was uh, looking for a single voice and they submitted a duet. And the question is essentially, why can't the screeners hear oh. that this duet could be sung as a solo voice? We absolutely can. Uh, I mean, I can hear that type of stuff. However, if your lyrics are, are singing to each other or something in that, I think then it takes an extra step in the songwriting process of my mind to go, okay, well, if they change this perspective from being that, from looking at her and him looking at her, uh, uh, her looking at him, it would be a little bit harder for the executive to do that as well. They kind of, like I said, need to hear that like where it is. Um, I don't think it's bad for you to have in your, you know, toolbox a version that is a solo artist. Like, what is it going to, it's going to take you, what, one session to have somebody record it or even you record your own version as a solo song. But it's really going to just take you rewriting a few of those little corner lyrics that make it a duet and just making a, a, a solo version. So. And the, the single biggest question we've been asked for the last 23 years uh, is why can't you give it to the industry and see if they can hear through it? Because they're and, going to throw it back at us. <laughs> but, right. Or they and, might not even say anything. <laughs> and never call us again. Yeah. Uh, they come to Taxi because they have a specific need and, and they want to see if our members can meet it. Um, and we like to deliver a certain level as well. So. And, but uh, be aware that it doesn't mean that everything's got to have super slick, you know, radio, EDM, dancey pop, uh, high-end production. Uh, we put listings out all the time that are asking for, you know, downer, depressed, introspective singer-songwriters where it could be a, an acoustic guitar that hasn't had new strings in three years that's ever so slightly out of tune with a vocal that sounds like somebody got kicked in the throat, did three shots of tequila and swallowed some sand before they sang it, but the emotion is there. And the lyrics take on such incredible meaning, uh, meaning that it would work really, really well in the context of a scene about somebody being hurt in a, you know, emotionally hurt in a, in a TV scene. So it doesn't always have to be that everything has super slick production. It's about being appropriate for what you're pitching it for. Right. Um, is music x-ray legit? Uh, I will not comment on that. Um, I don't even know what that is.
Mm. I don't know. But I'm a songwriter. Which one are you pointing at? Someone's father passed away, and you have uh, probably uh, a bunch of songs that they had written. I see. That's actually oh. something that came up fairly recently uh, in the past few years with somebody it, reaching out to me. If you have, we've actually had taxi members who have an inher inherited their parents' catalog and have the legal ownership uh, of the copyright and the masters. And we've hooked them up with a publisher that specializes in that stuff. And now the second generation family members are making money. And, and, and almost more importantly is their parents' music is getting out there and they're really appreciative. That's a good appreciate. answer. Yeah. What do I use for production? See, um, well, I run Logic and uh, I've got two computers. I just got a new Power Mac, which looks kind of like a trash bin. And um, and then I also have two. Well, I have three computers, but I have two uh, Power Mac, P, like the uh, desktop versions, are really big, and they've kind of consolidated those now, which has only been five years. It's crazy, but um, so I record on Logic on that, and I never upgraded to Logic X because that computer, I was hearing so many bugs were happening with the update and plugins, and I've got all of these. Uh, licenses to all these different third-party things and I just didn't want to mess with whatever was working so so I never updated with that but um, yeah I use logic and um, on my new my new desktop I haven't uh, moved all of my equipment over yet because the new desktop version um, sorry my hands are here the desktop version is a sil it's like literally like a trash bin about this tall it's very portable but it's very powerful um, it requires a Thunderbolt adapter oh. for the Firewire. So, I mean, it's really been only five years between the two machines, and all of a sudden, all of the equipment that I have now needs a new type of input on the other, you know, computer. So, Thank you, Apple. We love you, but... Absolutely. So <laughs> I've got two machines. I have Logic X on this one, and then I've got, you know, Logic 8, I think, on the other one. And so, yeah. I'm using a, a lot of people ask me what microphone I use. I use a, it's funny, they don't even make the one I have anymore. I bought, it's the same microphone I've had since I was 17. It's awesome though. It's a Bluetooth, uh, it's a Groove, Groove Tube GT55, and they don't even make it anymore. I think the company was bought out. Um, a member named Joy Frost, I believe she's a relatively new member and she's uh, been very active on our forum, um, has had some forwards, and I believe, some placements, and I I think she's in Germany, if I'm I think, pretty sure she's in Germany, but she's American. And she posted the coolest thing. She said she's using like GarageBand and very, very basic stuff and getting, so just to let you know that you don't need to have $10,000 worth of gear. She's using GarageBand, which comes free in every Mac um, computer. And it's pretty unbelievably good for, I mean, you can make a record on GarageBand. She got an MXL microphone and she took a box from Ikea, which I would say is roughly, you know, two feet by two feet, lined it with acoustic foam rubber. Uh, yeah, foam rubber, not styrofoam, foam rubber. Put the microphone in there, mounted on a mic stand, made herself like a little mini vocal booth and her stuff sounds really, really good. It's kind of funny what you can do, and especially if you're um, if you're producing in GarageBand, you can always export a lot of those things as MIDI, and if you're uh, like you can export them as the MIDI files. And uh, what I've done, I mean, I don't use GarageBand, but when I've seen a lot of people do that, they can send me the MIDI files if I'm collaborating with somebody. Mm -hmm. They can send me the MIDI files, and I could drop those into the same BPM on Logic, and then all of a sudden I have access to a whole plethora of plugins where I can use their chord progressions and their you know whatever they've created and bring it to a new level. So the MIDI information is really great on that. What's an up and coming genre? It's so funny to me. There's um, I have a lot of friends that are making like 90s house music and they're kind of structuring it to a radio format. It's, uh, I mean, we always re, especially kids from, you know, the 80s, 90s, they're, everyone's reusing the 80s, 90s sound right now because we didn't experience it like how we are going to experience it now, you know. So uh, I would say 90s house is one that a lot of, a lot of DJs are even kind of going for. I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Um, yeah, someone's seen her vocal booth, that's great. Yeah, I think it's under um, the general hangout is where I think I saw that. Somebody asked if I use that production setup on my big hits. I actually do, um, yeah, I mean, you'd believe the quality that you can get out of even just a home recording studio now. I mean, my I have a, a two bedroom condo here in LA and I have a office nook in there as well and that office nook is where I, I record and uh, produce at all the time. 
Um, and there's many a times where I'll work with a DJ who's in Germany or I'll work with a DJ, you know, Dada Life in Sweden and I'll send them my vocal files that I recorded in my, just my home studio apartment and um, then I'll send it off, you know, and then they'll process whatever I send them at their, at their level as well. Um, I have a friend named Rob Shirelli who's done like, I don't know, somewhere between 75 and 100 gold and platinum records is either an engineer, mixer, producer. Um, he works in a space in his house. I mean, he, yes, he goes to big studios sometimes to finish a project, but the vast majority of his work is done in his home studio on a, a pretty hefty Mac computer running Pro Tools. And uh, he almost everything is done in the box. He doesn't even have faders. Everything is done with a track um, trackball. Um, sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, the guy makes amazing sounding records. So you can do it. Um, what do I, future house, I like that. <laughs> what do you use for your vocals? Um, are you speaking specifically on plugins? Because I could tell you a, a few little secrets that I've found over the years. Um, the for well for my mic starting with my microphone, I have the GT55, which they don't make anymore. So, uh, but you can find comparable ones. It's a tube mic, um, and then I run that into my DVX compressor limiter. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I run that into my um, my preamp, and then into my DVX compressor and limiter, and that which, goes into which DVX do you have? What is it? I the have 160? No. Is gosh, it? what is it? I don't remember. I have to. I used to have it. DBX 160s that had a yeah. meter on them, but not, you know, LED meters, actual it's meters. It's an LED meter, yeah. And everybody laughed at me back in the day. This was like mid 70s, and now they're going for like stupid money. I, I loved it. It had super fast attack. Oh, like meter. everyone wants one now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. working one? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. a working one, exactly. But they had super fast attack and release, and they were really good for like drum stuff and. Yeah, at the time, I didn't love it, but I liked it and loved it on a few things. Now people are dying to get their hands on them. Um, yeah, that's funny. It's it's just funny how a few years, all of a sudden, things become like they're like collector's items. Everyone's like, what? Let me get that. Let me see. I'm looking up something really quick. Um, but then when I, I, I go through a Firewire interface, and then that goes into my, my Mac, and then uh, obviously my settings and logic are set to recognize that um, interface. And then from there, the channel strip is where you can get really like creative. Um, you got basically the dry signal of your voice coming through, which sounds nothing but like a muffle, like you know, vocal. Until you really get it, like I EQ on my, I I, I bypass all the effects on the compressor limiter, other than the compressing and limiting. Um, there's EQ options and things like that, but I like to do that on the computer because I have, feel like I have a little bit more control. Because um, a lot, of, a lot of even the Logic plugins, you can you can really control a lot of different things. Um, but uh, basically, then a, a little tip that I give people is there's a plugin called Chris Lord Algae. Obviously, everyone knows who Chris Lord Algae is, but he has a vocal plugin CLA dash VOC. It's in the Waves bundle. Uh, if you can get your hands on the Waves bundle. That Chris Lord Algae plugin, I can't tell you what it does to that vocal, but it just like, it brings it to this level where you're like, whoa, I sound like a rock star when I have that on my voice. <laughs> and it doesn't do any type of tuning or anything like that, but it just adds this like gritty, compressed feel to the vocal that uh, I can tell you many big producers that I won't name names are using CLA. And uh, yeah, see Jim knows CLA. Um, and CLA is just a really awesome plugin, and I think you can find on YouTube some tutorials. And if you want to just an automatic like uh, example, check out YouTube and the CLA plugin and how people are using it on their vocals. One sixty is fat. That it was. You know what is really good for? Um, if you had a gated acoustic guitar part, like the acoustic guitar part on the song Jack and Diane by John Cougar Mellencamp back in the day, and run that through a 160 and just hammer it, it sounded amazing. I mean, it was clearly affected. It, the 160 was not a limiter that was made not to be noticed, <laughs> but it sounded great. Um, Jim Carvalho wants to know what your pre is. My preamp, my uh, it's a it's a blue preamplifier actually. I use a blue the blue product, which is great. I mean, um, it's funny because I have another one and it started getting a buzzing noise in it. And I went home to Arizona to visit my family and 
I don't know how I didn't remember that I had purchased a preamp in Arizona. This was probably five years ago, six years ago, but it was just sitting brand new in a box. It was an even bigger preamplifier. And it was at just your parents' house? At my parents' house, and they never told me it was there. And uh, mind crap. you, I've only been in LA for seven years, so it's not like it's been there for 20 years in a box, but it was just sitting in my old bedroom, brand new. And I was like, when did I buy that? And I was like, did you guys get this? And then I thought, maybe my brother got this. Why did my brother get this? And then I was like, I'm taking it. <laughs> so <laughs> I brought it back. It's a blue It's a blue preamp. Maybe your parents are closet producers. Yeah. And mind you, I'm recording a lot of, uh, I actually do final vocals at my place. But most of the time, what I'm recording is uh, a demo vocal. And I, I make it sound pristine, though. I make sure that it sounds like it's going to be you know, going on the radio. However... That's not to say that somebody won't record the vocal, re-record the vocals um, at a studio, you know, wherever they're at. Because I shop my songs from my house, so. Um, Peter Rahill wants to know if you can distinguish country from new country. I don't know how much you know about country. We've never had the country chat. Before. Yeah, I've gone. It's like that forbidden chat. No, I've <laughs> never. I've gone to uh, uh, Nashville a few times, and actually, it's weird because my country friend just called me as we're sitting here. Uh, I went to go write with her and her group called Bombshell. They had a hit called Fight Like a Girl in, in Nashville. Um, and it's just interesting to me because country is such a cool, like, it's just, I don't know, there's more storytelling involved in it, which I do definitely kind of incorporate in, in a way into what I do with pop music where I'm telling a story. But they like to sit down at a piano. I walked into my session um, and I was working with a guy, an awesome uh, songwriter named Shane Stevens. He's written like American Honey. He's written some really big country hits. Uh, we walked into the room and I was expecting to run a session. Like I was ready to sit at a, ta at a computer and like, <laughs> like, okay, let's write a song. You're going to sing it. I'm going to sit here and record you. There was nothing in the room. Just it was an just a guitar. A, well, there's a uh, piano, uh, his guitar, <laughs> him, my co-writer and me and a, like a, you know, a few water bottles. And yeah. I was like. What do we do? No, <laughs> I didn't say that. I just was like, Welcome okay, well, Nashville. this is, yeah, this is a new thing. I was like, let's do this since, you know, and I was they'll like, do it five times a day. Oh, yeah. And but you know what? We wrote two songs so quickly, like boom, boom. But we had like, uh, we used our, our iPhones as the um, work tape, they call them over there. Yeah. Like, at our, we call them demos. Here, I mean, in Nashville, they call them work tapes. And so all we did was just record references on our iPhones. We have a file now of what the song should sound like. And then their process is to take that to a studio, get a live band in there, record, you know, based off of your work tape, whatever right. it is, and then, you know, produce a full song on that, which it, it's so weird because there's, I guess there really is no right or wrong because that's not the way that I would do it. I would leave that session six hours later with a finished song. <laughs> so Look, in Nashville, a lot of times, most of the time when they're cutting records, they don't schedule six weeks in a studio and go in with a bunch of songs. Absolutely. They'll go in and cut one or two at a time and then two months later cut two more. And then when they're like a month out from handing it into the label, they'll decide they don't have a big enough single and they'll put out, you know, the emergency we need one more hit single and then go cut that. Yep. And they'll book the studio time before they even have the songs. It's kind of interesting, yeah. yeah. And but it, works. it gets expensive that way too, I think. But um, Let's see. John, did it creep out when my 50-year-old wife... Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> did it creep out? <laughs> well, I don't know about Russell's that. wife came on to John in an elevator in two... Do you know Russell? 20 I know Russell. Um, I mean, it's not like we're besties or anything, but yeah, we've spoken on the phone. I certainly know who he is. Uh, I oh, don't remember that. John, you got to understand this whole thing about John's hair. John sometimes has... It's still here, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he'll puff it up and do like, uh, I don't know, what do you call that? when you? I just stick like... my finger in a light bulb or in a light <laughs> socket and it's just done. Now, sometimes he comes thing. in with his hair is like eight inches high. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's what Russell's talking about. Yeah, you know, actually, Russell, you said 2012. Vaguely, do I remember that? But you have to also understand that's a very common uh, <laughs> tactic people use to talk to me. <laughs> so it's probably in my head somewhere. If I saw your face and your wife's face, I probably would immediately recall. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I get that a lot. Actually, fortunately, I think it's great. <laughs> that's why we hired him to be a screener because he had cool hair. That was that's it. all it took. <laughs> um, let's see. Where did all the questions go? How do you get rid of background noises when you're recording? Um, Whoa. Mary Band is asking that, and I'm assuming that Mary Band means background noises like, you know, the furnace turning on or dogs barking outside versus um, like 
chair squeaks or clicking or well no, well i'm thinking more like you know um just hiss that we used to deal with from tape and, and amplifier noise within a console you know preamp noise stuff like that so if you're talking about background noise um i i say use uh uh joy frost homemade little box at the ikea thing because it's microphones if you're using a cardioid mic it's made to pick up from the front and very little from the back so aim yourself at end of the mic on, on the live side of the mic put the dead side of the mic facing into that dead box then also put yourself in a corner with some moving blankets taped up or nailed up or something in the corner so it's dead behind you dead in front of you and that will dramatically reduce noise that's coming bouncing off of other walls and, and a dog barking outside if you got a dog barking outside cock the window throw a blanket up over it put cardboard up in uh fiberglass then cardboard then caulk around it. there's all kinds of stuff you can do which is why i took two pillows in my parents house and sat underneath the desk and made my own little booth <laughs> so. every time he says pillows i want to go to sleep remember my <laughs> wife only let me get three and a half hours of sleep last night uh, when we were given these example vocals, they all sing swing Rat Pack style, but then we we're asked to provide something modern for them. Just haven't met you yet. Example track. The two don't seem to go. Um, that question's not all that clear. I might want to find a way to restate that. Are you saying is the reference track isn't alongside or isn't in the vein of what we're requesting? Is that what you're saying? How do you approach signing the paperwork with your co-collaborators? I just do it up front. I'm very much, uh, let's get it on the table first. I've dealt with plenty of situations where people are almost like when, when things start moving, uh, you see people start throwing the rope off the edge, being like, sorry, sorry, you know, like, and you got to really have some of that stuff, you know, in, in writing up front, I, I guess. It depends on the situation. If you're writing a song just to write a song with somebody and there's no intention behind it, you know, you're probably not going to be like, all right, so we're splitting this evenly, right? Like, you know, it's more organic than that. But if you're in a professional environment or if you're writing with somebody collaborating for the idea that this will go somewhere, you should talk about it. There's two of us. That's 50-50. You know, there's three of us. That's 33-33. Uh, there's four of us. It's 25, you know, five and so on. But, um, you know, you should definitely get that out of the way first. I've dealt with people who also, there's a production team where they go, okay, well, um, there's three, you know, there's two writers and two producers, and we claim, you know, this amount of uh, publishing up front, and then you guys can split the rest. Depending on the scenario, if they are looking for what's called the lion's share, you know, I mean, depending on the scenario, you, you deal with it when it comes. Uh, I saw somebody talk, uh, asked a question about, the external noise is quiet, but I'm still hearing hiss. Chances are you are not um, taking advantage of uh, doing a good job with gain staging. Um, just as a general practice, put your input fader at zero, put your mix fader at zero, and set your mic pre somewhere around noon, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and you should be in the ballpark, depending on, of course, how loud, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, is it an acoustic guitar or a kick drum or an electric guitar? But what you don't want to have happen is that you're pushing one portion, like your input fader or your mic pre or the output of a limiter or compressor too much. Or it could be that you've got a, a reverb pro program that has a lot of inherent noise and you've got very little signal going to the reverb, but you're bringing back a lot of signal from it. So you're getting the inherent noise that's in there. If you adjust your gain so that everything is at unity gain and then tweak it from there, you'll probably see a lot of that hiss go away. Somebody asked about writing lyrics or working with somebody who writes lyrics, produces their own vocal and is their vocalist. Do you split it 50-50? Well, I guess guitar guru Mike uh, what is it that you're contributing to the song? Are you just recording them as an engineer or are you actually using creativity to produce something and bring what they're doing to the next level? Because what I find in the industry is, is a lot of times, I actually personally, I'll work with people who have a fully written song and they already have a track to it and they're like, I just need a place to record it and somebody who really knows what they're doing recording me. So I'll just say, cool, you pay me my day rate and you come in and I record you. You know, I don't get any of that publishing. If they ask me to tweak things and a lot of times 
I'll hear a song and I'll go, man, I can make that so much better. But like, you know, I'll sit there and I'll mention to them, hey, are you interested in me helping you tweak a verse or something? Then, you know, then you can talk about publishing splits on that side. But if, if you're just recording them, charge them something to record them in your studio. If you're producing a track for them and you're actually using creativity, time, and effort in making what they've done great, you should probably be getting some publishing for that. Yeah, and typically I just like to, I mean, it depends on how stingy that person is, but I usually just split it 50-50. So, because you're bringing one half of that Oreo together, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've been in the business for 40 years you're the first time the first guy that ever said bring one half of that Oreo together um, I should make a shirt <laughs> yeah there you go um, Russell Landwehr says something about a noisy condenser mic yeah sometimes you have a you know a crummy old condenser mic that's got a lot of inherent noise um Everybody in the room working on the song gets the same share if you're co-writing together. Yes, there are times that somebody's just really not doing quite anything and everybody feels that about that. But you have to look at your future scenarios with these right. people. Are you going to be working with that person again? There's been plenty of times where I've personally felt maybe I didn't do as much as that other writer in this and that person just it just oozed out of them really quickly and you know I tweaked a few little things on what we were working on and that's not me feeling a ashamed about what I do or b feeling like I have to you know be like oh well I did this and that. it's really just going owning up to what you've done and going okay you know and having that conversation as a human being with another human being but also remember you might be writing again with that person so if you right. have a co-writing you know I have a really amazing friend named Melanie Fontana we write together twice three times a week and we, wow. we have so much success together we have songs coming out with the chain smokers and we have songs all over radio in Nor Norway and stuff like that we have a lot of different stuff together She's talented in her own right. I'm talented in my own right. But when we join forces, we create something really great. And we recognize that sometimes there's a time where I'll like, be like, I have an idea. Even before you came over, I came up with this concept. And I have a hook idea. And I almost like have a verse idea. But I think you can fill in the gaps. And then she's like, cool, let's do it. And then there's other times where she'll be like, hey, we have a, we're pitching something to Target and for a commercial. And I already have a concept. They already want me to talk about these certain things. Will you record me and help me write the verses? And then at that point, I'm like, OK, well, you have an idea I'm helping you fill it in so but we know that our relationship is a working relationship and so we don't get stingy on because whether find, or not you find the balance uh, in aggregate over time it equals totally yeah and you know what why would you not that per want that person to be just as successful as you if you're in a right if you're in a partnership it's like you know owning a business and then like co-owning a business with somebody and then that person not you know you wanting to hold something from them it's like you guys built that business together why are you you know doing that so it's just you I have a lot of those partnerships and there's been a lot of times where people have been like well you only did this and I'm like yeah I only did that but that was the concept of your song so like <laughs> you know like so like what are you I getting I think at? I know what you're talking about but I won't <laughs> there, mention no, any but there, names. yeah there's definitely there's a lot of those things that happen in the industry I mean in Nashville basically if you're in the room if all you do is pour the water that day and, and dump out the ashtray yeah. you still get an equal slice in Nashville because they know that the day is going to come where where they're going to be the person that's pouring the water or emptying the ashtray. It does tend to find a balance over time. And you do want to get invited to their sessions. And, and so, so he yeah. answered us up here. He said, I wrote and co-wrote later coming in to work on it. And after that, we had a singer sing it for us. How much percentage should I get? So, well, a lot went by at that point. Um, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, if you wrote something with somebody and you tweaked what they wrote and, you know, you really should have that discussion with them. I always started off by what do you think I deserve? Not saying I deserve this, but, you know, what do you think I deserve? Nine times out of ten, that person's going to be like, well, we wrote this together. Like, they're not going to, you know, probably sting you. If they do get a little stingy, then I think I would remind them of what you did and then say, well, typically I would split this. But, you know, if we need to you know, go down a little bit, then I'm okay with that. But definitely don't, um, not, make sure you give yourself credit is what I'm get, getting at. Um, a. Carrig is clarifying his question in, of a few minutes ago. Thanks for answering, guys. You're the best. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, the example track doesn't seem to be in the style of the example artist. Just haven't met you yet is not 
inter-normal style, uh, in their normal style probably. Um, they're looking for modern, so we're just getting an idea of the vocal style. Again, it's still not that clear to me, but just know that it, it's the references sometimes, oftentimes, the references are arranged. Like, get yourself in the mindset. Um, would would the, the song that you have or the song that you're creating, would that fit on a playlist with those other people? It's not, it, they're looking for something just like that. It, it sometimes we'll be looking for instrumental tracks, but the best example to give you is something with a vocal, and we'll say in the listing, disregard the fact that this has a vocal on it. It's the instrumental that you need to listen to. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm still not really understanding the question. If you're thinking that that song doesn't fit within the request, I guess, then um, you know you should be just checking. I mean, I don't really know how to answer that either. I, we, we do a pretty good job here of making sure that we're not just throwing things onto the listing. We have a whole team of people that are overviewing everything and checking it, double-checking it. Yeah, usually at least two, if not three people have checked out those references before they've gone out to you guys. Uh, and sometimes, you know, look, I admit that many people in the industry that hand us references, John has probably seen this working here all these years, that we'll get a listing that somebody will um, email us a listing and say, uh, find me EDM like train. Huh? <laughs> what? Uh, they don't even know what they want. They right. want they want a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they want you to marry it together. And you're like, okay, but nine times out of ten, we're not going to get that. We're going to have to find something, you know, slightly. Yeah, we'll we'll call them up and say, you know, this doesn't really jive or jibe, jive, jive. Um, and, and so we need clarification. Are you looking for EDM? Or are you looking for train? Well, I'm looking for something like that train song that's got kind of an EDM beat. Oh, okay. So it's a particular song that's not really indicative of what Train would normally do during the course of their career. So we have to refine stuff like that, and then we do our very best to, to relay that back to you. Um, there's so many recording interfaces. Um, like I said, I'm switching to a new my new Mac system, which is just sitting there looking pretty. I feel like it's getting old by the time I'll even get a new recording interface on that one. But um, I mean, for some for an affordable one, man, there's so many. I'm a big, huge fan. I don't, I get nothing for this. Um, the Apogee one. Apogee, yeah, yeah, <laughs> man. Easy That's the one use. with the, the, it's the square with a knob on it, Yeah, right? it, looks, yeah. it looks like, it's like the size of an iPhone, it's got one big knob on it. Yeah. And you can plug a guitar or bass into it. It's got a built-in microphone that Bob Clearmount and actually tuned the microphone. The, the mic sounds amazing. And the thing's like 300, 350 bucks. Really portable too for a lot of people who are traveling and recording. And oh, absolutely. Got, you got a Mac laptop or an iPad. You know, I mean, you can records. absolutely make a record with nothing more than an oh, Apple yeah. G1 absolutely. and a, a Mac laptop with a decent amount of RAM in it. Um, you can make a record with that if you know what you're doing. I think Al City did do that. Pretty sure that the, his first record was like just made on his laptop. So. <laughs> Um, oh gosh, who's, who's the band? Uh, the Apogee guys actually have a video of a band doing a whole record on, uh, with nothing more than the one, you know, it, 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 you can do it. Do I schedule? That's actually a good question because I deal with scheduling of my life. Just, it's so, it's so whatever flies at me that day. But Russell asks, do I schedule my day music wise or do I just do whatever hits me at the time? Well, I would say 90% of my day is focused on music, and then the other 10% is eating and going to the gym. <laughs> but like most of the day is music. I start my day off every morning coming into the taxi, listening to music, getting things going, you know, on that front. I really, taxi energizes me to get home because sometimes I'm like, I just got to write that song, you know, like I just get in the mood of it. So I'm really thankful for having taxi for that. But when I get home, I do, I get usually, it's 5.30 here, but usually I get, um, home around like eh, 1 30 or 2 and then I'll say okay I'm gonna grab a bite to eat and then I'm gonna finish that song up from 3 30 until 6 and then I'm gonna hit the gym and then I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna tweak whatever I'm gonna listen to that at the gym I'm gonna tweak whatever I worked on you know whatever it is or if I have a session scheduled um, I don't try I try not to schedule my days every single day with session after session after session I did that for about five years 
And uh, it really does eat up your concepts and it burns you out. You know, you just sit there and you're like, oh man, I got to go to this session. So now I started taking sessions for the industry that were productive and lucrative and things that I, I think are actually going to go somewhere instead of just writing whatever, whenever with whoever, because that does burn you out. At least it burns me out. Uh, somebody asked, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, I just had a country rejection and the screener suggested that, I, I'm uh, paraphrasing, that I take a blues approach. Was the screener just being nice? Can you answer? How, so, would, how would you, are the screeners just being nice? Was that screener just being nice or was the screener trying to give that person something that they could do something with? You know, it's funny. Um, there's times when it goes through my mind as I'm writing these critiques that I'm like, you know what? I know how it feels to be that person. Like, especially during the customized critiques, when they're asking certain questions, I can feel the fears. I can also feel the uh, self doubts. I can feel a lot of those things. And so, just regarding those type of things, I do try to word things like not not in like I'm being nice, but I'll do that. I'll definitely give them a direct answer, but I'll also help eliminate some of those fears or anxieties that those people have or whatever. If I can sense that, if it's on an S listing, I'll definitely uh, be a little bit more just blunt to the point. Got to get through, you know, like a bunch of songs today, and I'm looking for the one, you know, but I want to make sure I'm helping this person. I don't necessarily, I'm not super sweet, but I'm also not, I'm never negative in my in my um, comments. I think I'm constructive. So um, we tell the screeners, don't sugarcoat it. Be nice, be helpful, be yeah. honest, but don't sugarcoat it. We're not going to help you guys get better by blowing smoke up anybody's patootie. We want you guys to get better for our own selfish reason, which is we want you to become successful so that we can brag about we helped you become successful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's funny because in the and it feels good. Yeah, it does. But in the in the screener room, it's always so cool when I walk in and it, it feels like I'm in a studio when I walk in because you got gold plaques lining the walls and you know we've had success and it's awesome to see it up on the wall. Let's see, hey John. Oh, let's see. Let's go up a little bit before. Big chorus needed, boilerplate, or is that actual request? <laughs> That's every song in the industry, or every everybody wants a big chorus. Well, think about it. I mean, it depends. If you're if you're a film TV library looking for easy listening music, you might not have a big, you know, big chorus, but it might just be like a little vocal thing in the background that hooks in your brain and you're just singing doop da you know, along with it. <laughs> but when it comes to pop music, it's all about the chorus. How many times do you go to the bar and then it's like, we're halfway there. Ah! You know, that's got to be the the catch. Everyone, everyone, it's the, I call it the karaoke hook. Like, nice. if you're going up to a karaoke thing, you want to be like, I want that song, and then everyone will sing along with me. I don't really listen to music unless I'm trying to sing along, you know? So that's just my personal preference, but you need that big chorus hook. You know what? Let's talk about hooks. I'd actually written that question. I had a bunch of prepared questions in case you guys didn't come through, uh, but you have. So my, one of the questions I prepped was... We use the word hook all the time in so many of our listings because back in my day in the prehistoric record industry, the hook was the chorus. It was that big, mm -hmm. obvious hook. But now um, everything has to be interesting from the first measure. So there will be a little arpeggiated keyboard thing that's a hook or a guitar riff that's a hook or it could be a rhythmic thing that's a hook or a little vocal thing that's a rhythmic vocal thing. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to have hooks, but they expect you to have a hook in the intro, in the verse, and then a giant hook in the chorus. Uh, am I nuts? I mean, and you can tell me I'm nuts if you think I am, but it, it seems like the... the that's one way that they've raised the bar over the years is that listeners have, um, we're ADD and it's really hard to keep our attention at, you know, in aggregate, all people, so that you have to build in little things to hook the listener every step of the way. We're not going to wait one minute and 21 seconds to get to the big damn chorus. Right. Well, it really just depends. I think um, there's songs definitely that I work on that there isn't a hook in the intro, but you know, it's maybe not EDM with EDM excuse me, and pop music. A lot of times, they're they're looking for that melodic hook that kind of gets in your head, whatever it is, you know that little like just doop 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 that's in your head in Vegas, you know. And then, for example, Timber, um, Kesha, I'm yelling Timber. She's got 
uh, the, the melodic guitar that's in there and that just gets drilled into your head and you're just like, oh my gosh. And then she follows that up with singing along to it now in a vocal hook. And so, right. I'm and you, and you know, like, as soon as the song comes on by yeah. the second note, what that song is. Yep. Totally. It's a marketing device, but it, it's pleasurable. Yeah, definitely. And a hundred percent. And I think that it's important to, um, keep the audience entertained. I mean, that's what we're in the entertainment industry. You've got to keep people engaged on it. Um, I was just telling somebody in a critique before I hopped on taxi music uh, or taxi TV that um, you you really do have to kind of just get to the point. And so to get to the point, you've got to introduce hooks after hooks after hooks. That way you're kind of keeping the audience, you know, listening. And especially for film and TV, you've got maybe 15 to 20 seconds they're using your song if you're lucky. And it's got to get to some type of a hook so that person can get off and start listening to it, you know. All right, couple more questions, and we gotta wrap this puppy up. Um, there's a lot of chatting, not a lot of questions. Is John wearing black contact lenses? No. <laughs> no, I'm a lizard man. <laughs> Every time I see Hey You Guys, I think of the Goonies. Hey, you. Oh, yeah, you just said it right there. What's the Goonies? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to slip in one of the questions, see if I can find one. Um, I saw Jim ask me a question about nightclubs in L.A. Honestly, they just changed the name of nightclubs in L.A. because the crowd gets a little bit outdated. It's the same nightclub, same owner. They just changed the name. <laughs> so, and the bartender. And maybe. the bartender, yeah. Um, okay, uh, everybody talks about beats. Everybody wants fresh beats. Um, I don't come from that era, so I have no expertise whatsoever. What should somebody do who's an acoustic singer-songwriter and wants to take the plunge into making beat-driven pop music? What's the first piece of gear or software they should buy, and how do they go from using the out-of-the-box uh, beats to... How do you learn how to take an existing beat and doctor it up to make it like really cool? Okay, so coming from what? I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Um, let's say I'm, a, I'm an acoustic singer-songwriter, you right. know, guy who who's... maybe has that experience with recording and like um, on the contemporary well, pop level. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I've got uh, Pro Tools. I'm relatively good, but everything I do has you know like doubled acoustic guitars, vocals, bass. Sure. Um, an electric guitar, that's the kind of stuff I'm doing. And now I want to move into beat driven. The first pop radio stuff. Where do I go? Which which beats do I buy? How do I learn how to make them better? Okay. Uh, well, I'm thinking of an affordable route and like something that is more out of the box. So, you know, the first piece of equipment that actually you, you would think is everybody would already just have it. But a lot of times I would find, and I'm not calling these like guys older, but a lot of them are not really familiar like with recording and stuff. And really, I would say get a MacBook or a Mac or even I like to work on Mac. So I'm partial, but get a get a laptop that has you know recording power of this generation. But uh, let's let's assume that you've got, got that. that. Okay, and I'm just talking about what do they use to make beats? How do what so, gear, what software do they use, and how do they learn how to? Because everybody sure. hates it in the industry when you just use a beat that's right out of you know. Sure, out yeah, of the box. definitely. Uh, well, you know, a really up and like a fast up and coming uh, software is Ableton. That's one that a lot of um, uh, EDM DJs are using, and the control you have is really great. Uh, as far as a third party plugin, if you're using like Logic or Pro Tools, there's a really great drum machine um, plugin called Battery, which you can uh, get a bunch of sound packs and and drum samples, um, and they even include some. But that you can, it's like a drum machine. You can program drums in Battery, and you know, do it that way. If you don't do your own little MIDI thing on your own and just put your own samples in. Uh, battery is great. It's kind of like a controlling device for your samples in a way. Okay. So, you, so it looks like a drum machine. You can drop them in and then you can program within that, you know. And then, but it's all it's all software driven. I mean, it's on a screen. It's not an actual box. It's that... on the screen. Okay. Yeah, it's software driven. Um, as far as an actual box, I'm not even in sessions where most people are using drum machines. I mean, there's one producer that I definitely uh, admire and I've worked with personally and, and known for a while, Rodney Jerkins, Dark Child. He uses a drum machine 
machine. But you know, he's controlling samples that are you know, and now bring being brought onto the computer. But some people just have their, they just like to have their groove here with their whatever yeah. they're doing, you know. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, I would say get a good get a good drum machine. You know, um, if you're not somebody who likes to just piece samples together yourself, like I'll just open up a, a pack of sample uh, drum like you know kicks. And uh, this one will be called 808s or whatever, or you know whatever they title them. And then I'll just drop them in, and then I'll time it on the track, you know, in Logic, and I'll do it myself, chopping them up, fading in and out, you know, stuttering them, running them through effects, exporting them, dropping them back in. If you don't want to do all that, there's a lot of third-party plugins that'll you know give you the option. But Ableton's a really great one for EDM and dance. How do you become a tastemaker with beats? Doing everything you just described, stuttering, chopping, fading them in and out, yeah. um, rolling off Reverse. top of it. Yeah. yeah, doing all that stuff. How do you learn how to be tasteful in doing that and not sound like you're Frankenstein gone bad? I think uh, <laughs> there's art and simplicity. I think that if you're, if you're simple with it and you're not so like all over the map people your ear is not connecting to everything flown at you at once you need to hear a few simple things you know there's a really great hip-hop producer out named DJ Mustard and he does a lot of artists out right now has a lot of hits he's a really great producer I'm gonna have to catch up with him DJ Mustard yeah he yeah, you missed it. oh got you <laughs> bada boom I did miss that wow <laughs> I was like, okay. Sorry. I thought I thought you were familiar. I was like, okay. Uh, but anyways, his beats are very simple. You know, er, er, doom, 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 er. it's just really simple, yeah. like, but hooky, chanty, very like memorable moments in the song. You know, you can you can really maximize a kick if you process it correctly to be really memorable. Oh man, that kick from that, you know. And then a lot of times you'll find producers that want that kick, so they'll sample it out of your song and put it in their song or whatever. Mm -hmm. I see so many sound packs that producers in the industry pass around and it's like this producer's kick from that song and this producer's kick and you're just like you know make your own stuff but <laughs> well yeah we should wrap it up we're five minutes over um thank you uh, i had a blast man, yeah. I, I love having you on the show um i love being I, here yeah i feel like i learn a lot having you here i'm sure these guys learn a lot so we'll have to have you back in less time than two years. Yeah, let's do it this um, year. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, let's try and have you back in the next 30 days so we That'd can do great. a listening session. Um, sure. Because I really want to do that today, but this is kind of a, a great... Uh, and I'll bring some examples of some stuff that uh, for the next one that I think people would enjoy, you know, as far as what I'm awesome. hearing and, and what I'm listening to. So That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for watching. We will see you next week. <laughs> yeah. Now that's a beat. <laughs> see you next week on another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye, you guys. Thanks, John. See you. Yeah, thank you.